Hi everyone, welcome back. So let's continue with chapter two measurement techniques. Uh, and today we'll, in this video, we will cover cathode ray oscilloscope or CRO, uh, galvanometers, as well as Hall probe. Let's get right to it. So in this image, we're looking at the control panel of uh, a cathode ray oscilloscope or simply put uh, CRO. Um, the uh, cathode ray oscilloscope is uh, good for measuring two things. Uh, one of them is uh, the amplitude of any signal. Um, so what do we mean by that? Um, you might see, and I'll use a different color for this, you might see on the screen uh, something that perhaps look like, looks like a sine wave of some kind. Um, so you can see, you know, how much the deviation is uh, from uh, the vertical, uh, essentially, uh, in the vertical direction. So that gives us the amplitude. You can also use uh, the um, uh, the CRO uh, to measure uh, short, and I emphasize this part here, short time intervals. Um, CROs are very interesting because, um, you know, if you've got an old style TV, you will know that it comes... Um, it, it works on the same principle. It will have a cathode ray tube inside it. Um, so, you know, like if you have one of those monster uh, old Sony TVs, you will probably know what I'm talking about here uh, rather than, you know, uh, like a plasma TV or something like that. Uh, what essentially we have here is if you apply a potential difference uh, in the, um, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to the Y input controls, um, you will end up moving the trace in, uh, in in a vertical direction and by trace we mean basically the form uh, of the wave uh, or whatever you know it might not look like a wave it might just might look like a straight line um, um, but that potential difference change in the y input would move this uh, wave form in the y direction in a vertical direction so make a note of that move in vertical and similarly, if you were to apply a delta V uh, to the um, to the X input, um, you would be able to move the signal um, from right to left. So move in the horizontal direction, horizontal direction. Why is this important? Let's have a look at that. So one of the things that you're going to have to learn how to do in the lab is to use a CRO to measure uh, change in uh, to, to, to measure change in voltage or potential difference essentially. Um, so let's look at a couple of scenarios. So if when you just simply turn on the CRO and you have no input on it, um, you're probably going to see uh, the CRO look something like this uh, with one. I'll use a different color for this. One spot in the center. You'll just see one blank uh, dot in the center. So you'll, it's, that would be called the trace. Uh, there is a, it's an unmoving uh, trace. Um, but what happens if you apply some kind of a potential difference to it? Let's take a look. So the parameter that you have under your control could be the X sensitivity or the Y sensitivity. So let's take the Y sensitivity here to keep our explanations uh, focused on the fundamentals and make it real simple. Uh, so the wire sensitivity is adjustable and you either measure it in volts per centimeters or you measure it in volts per division. So per, for every division that you see uh, on this uh, output panel. So for instance, this right here is one division. Um, so let us say for the sake of argument, we in this, in this example, we've set the um, wire sensitivity to be two volts per division. What happens if this blue dot on the top right chart, the blue dot uh, moves up here to this where this yellow dot is now located. So our trace has moved upwards by two divisions. So it's quite simple. We can calculate how much um, the voltage input was that was applied to this um, scenario. So the voltage input that we applied was two divisions times two volts per division, which is four volts. So let us take another example. 
um, let us say for the sake of argument, maybe the yellow dot doesn't move up quite so much. You know, it goes all the way up until here. So this is still um, a proportional change. So you would still take the, um, the voltage input here, voltage input, you would calculate that as, in this case, it's one and a half divisions. So one and a half times two volts per division gives us three volts. So that was the voltage that was applied in this case uh, in the y direction. What about if we go like this, if the yellow dot shows up on the bottom here, um, below where its original location? Well, all that means is that the voltage was applied in the different direction, in the reverse direction. Um, so here, uh, your input was uh, negative two divisions times two volts per division. And that gets us minus four volts, so essentially four volts in the other direction uh, than before. Another application we have with CROs is measuring time intervals. So in order to measure time intervals, you have to apply a time-based voltage across the X input. And I'll write that down for you so that it's easy to remember. So time-based voltage across the X direction or the X input, however you wanna phrase that. So basically what this does is it would drag a spot, this uh, this uh, blue spot that you have there uh, across the screen. So I'm gonna use a different color for this. Let me use the color red here. Um, so it would drag this very slowly across the screen before it basically you know, flies back to the beginning right there. The rate at which the time-based voltage drags the spot across the screen can be measured either in uh, seconds per division or divisions per second. You do need to be careful how it's being measured. Um, so I'm going to write that once again. Um, this would really screw up uh, whatever calculation you're doing. So be careful and always uh, be sure which way you are actually measuring, which method you're using uh, to measure the time-based voltage, the, or the rate rather, at which the time-based voltage is dragging across the screen. So what happens if we use a higher frequency time base? So I'm gonna say, I'm just gonna use a different color for this, let's use the color red here. So if you have a higher frequency time base, what happens? Well, basically, this blue spot is going to start getting dragged across the screen a little bit faster. So you might see uh, the, the the trace in a location here, but you'll also see like a little uh, tail that comes with it as well. Uh, so it's just an indication, and, and it'll still be moving, but it'll have a tail behind it. It's just an indication of it being moving faster. But what if it goes, you know, at uh, even, even higher, I'll call it an even higher frequency, um, would we expect the shape of this trace to change? In fact, yes, we would. Uh, if it goes fast enough, you would basically see a, uh, see a uh, trace which looks like a stationary line because it's moving so fast. So the fluorescence essentially lasts long enough for the spot to appear like a continuous line. What's interesting is if you now apply, and I'm gonna just undo this last one that we did here, uh, if you now apply uh, successive pulses to the Y direction, to the Y plate, wh while the time-based voltage is, is being uh, uh, applied, the trace might appear something like this. So you might see something that looks like so. You might see a pulse like that. Sorry. You might see a pulse that looks like that, which slowly then comes back down, continues to go on some more, and then another one. Maybe it doesn't go up quite as high, but it might look like this. And then, you know, it continues on from there. And here's the key part of this story. Essentially, the time interval between the pulses can be calculated by multiplying the number of divisions between the pulses. So essentially, this distance right here. Uh, so you can multiply the number uh, of uh, divisions between the pulses by the time base. That gives us uh, the time interval. So let's 
have a look at an example. So in this example, we have a survey ship that's sending down a sound pulse down to the seabed to measure uh, how deep uh, the ocean is at this point. And this, uh, we see two pulses come through. The original one being, you know, when the uh, sound pulse was sent and the second one being when it returned back to the ship. Um, in this example, we've set the time base of the oscilloscope to 50 milliseconds per division. And we also know that the speed of sound in water is uh, 1,500 meters per second. So how do we go about doing this? Well, the first thing we can establish is what is the time inter interval between the pulses? So uh, you can see that there are one, two, three divisions between these pulses. So we can go like this uh, between pulses equals three divisions times 50 milliseconds per division, which gives us 150 milliseconds or 0 0.15 seconds. And obviously your uh, distance is uh, your uh, velocity times time, which gives us 1500 times 0 0.15, which is 225 meters. Now, just remember, this is two pulses going and coming. So that means that the depth of the water uh, has to be 225 divided by two, which is 112 and a half meters. That is an example of an application where you would use a CRO. Let's move on to galvanometers. So your physics lab will probably have a selection of instruments for measuring currents and potential difference, voltage. There are two main types. One of them are analog meters in which a pointer moves over a scale and the other one is obviously digital. The one I would like to focus on is galvanometer, which is a sensitive current measuring analog meter. So I'll write that down for you. If we were to draw it as part of a circuit diagram, it would look something like this. So you have a, a galvanometer, which has been turned into an ammeter by way of applying a resistor here, which is sometimes called a shunt. Um, so if you put the resistor in parallel uh, with the galvanometer, you've basically turned it uh, into an ammeter. There is another application of this as well. Um, if you basically change this up and you put the galvanometer in series with this resistor, this would then this resistor then becomes called a multiplier. And it essentially now allows you to measure voltage. So you can take a galvanometer and use it to measure current and to measure voltage. Um, you will get from the manufacturer directly shunts and multipliers which are clearly labeled with the conversion and uh, uh, and what the full scale deflection would be inside the uh, ammeters, how much would the needle move by. Uh, for so, so all you need to do is select the correct shunt or multiplier required for your experiment and make sure you apply the correct factor when reading the scale. One thing I want to point out is sometimes you might see a scale, uh, let's say the dial of the ammeter looks like this with different reading measurements. You might see the needle moving in one direction or in the other direction. So this is called something with a center zero scale. Um, you would basically see the zero in the middle here. Uh, and what that does is, uh, it if you see the needle move into the left-hand side of the zero mark. That just is showing you a negative current. Essentially, this type of meter is, is used for null indication. Essentially, it's trying to say, is there current or is there not current in a certain part of a circuit? So that, ladies and gentlemen, is a galvanometer. So let's talk a little bit very quickly about Hall probes. So a Hall probe is a device that is used to measure the flux density of a magnetic field. Magnetic field flux density. Usually you will see it 
with some kind of a solenoid um, which uh, essentially would allow you to um, if you if you uh, remember it from your O level physics or even if you don't you can take it as a given that uh, the current uh, if it's moving in along this red line on top of this uh, it's, it's wrapped in a coil around this tube um, you would see the magnetic force acting sort of in this direction it's so how did I know that you can we will talk about this when we get to the uh, electromagnetism portion of this course but uh, for the moment take that as a given please so the hall probe is the semiconductor that you see which is at a right angles to the magnetic field uh, and it is essentially a thin slice of semiconductor material uh, which as I'm saying it's it's placed at right angles to the direction of the magnetic field um, the control unit there's a control unit attached to it uh, which is allowed arranged to pass a certain current through this slice and uh, separately you know we are going to be recording the control voltage as well so we'll apply a current and we'll measure the voltage that's generated across this slice of uh, um, a semiconductor material the voltage is basically proportional to the uh, to the flux density that is the principle under which uh, the Hall probe works and then you read that off an analog or a digital meter and that meter is already calibrated uh, meter is calibrated for the units of magnetic flux density uh, which is tesla so that ladies and gentlemen is how a hall probe works uh, so let's continue on with this uh, measurement techniques uh, chapter in our next video where we will talk about um, calibration curves and as well as that uh, furthermore we will talk about errors and uncertainties thank you for watching